always dance my way in on that. I love those little boop, 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 boop. It's so simple, yet so catchy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the weekly podcast broadcast of This Week in Science. We are back again. Yes, for the science. And we're going to broadcast the podcast live right now. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Although maybe not on Facebook because it oh. looks like that's broken again. <laughs> You're seeing it too. That's really funny. I, I don't know. I thought that I reset our whole thing to Facebook, but I don't know what to do. I don't know. How to, there we go. We got a thing. I'm going to hit a button and say start now. Maybe schedule start time. I don't know how to fix it. Make it go now. Maybe nope. Can't schedule for later. It's too late now. Don't change the thumbnail. Can't fix it. I don't. Save changes. Nope, didn't like it. Okay, forget it. Sorry, okay, Facebook. Well, I just I just posted to Facebook and told them to go to YouTube. So I'm sure the Zuck's not very happy about that. But you know what? I'm sorry. I don't know why I reset <laughs> our whole. I I specifically went to Facebook or went through the whole thing where you log in and you connect the services and you make it all talk nice to each other and it looked like it should have worked. And I'm sorry, Facebook. For those of you who cannot watch the show tonight on Facebook, I hope that you are able to watch the show later. They can't hear you, Kiki, because they I can't know. watch it. <laughs> May, I, <sighs> this is me talking to the trees. Maybe they can t- hear yeah. me. Maybe they can't. I don't know. But anyway. You speak for the y'all. trees. For the trees have no tongues. Anyway. Uh, but they have little eyes that watch us all the time. It's time for the science show. Let's talk about science. Mm. Mm-hmm. Not the ears or the eyes of the trees or the Facebooks that may or may not be allowing us to stream. We are podcasting and sometimes stuff like this happens and then it gets cut out. So that's not going to make it into the final Mm-mm. podcast. Ta-da! That's no. my disclaimer there. Yeah, no. The rest of it, though, the live video that gets recorded to the streaming places, this is what you get. All the fun stuff. Hello. You ready for a show? Let's do it. Let's do it. How about all you? Are you all ready for a show? I think they're ready, Kiki. I think give the people what they want, which is a show. (laughs) The science show. Would you like to hear some science? Okay, starting in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 936, recorded on Wednesday, June 26th, 1923. (laughs) (laughs) Man, the second you said that, I was like, really? (laughs) Really? Let's just forget about the last 23 years. (laughs) Going back. (laughs) Who cares? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) You want to take two that? <laughs> because the the tab next to this one in our rundown is July 19th. This is July. Don't this. don't try to explain it. It's not ex- it just sometimes nope. we do these things. It's fine. <laughs> okay. So Rachel, I'm going to say the date right now. So cut out all this stuff, please. <sighs> Recorded on Wednesday, July 26th, 2023. Nothing compares to science. Hey, everyone. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with a mysterious boundary, the Loch Ness Monster-ish, and why you should consider robbing an art museum. But first, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. In science, X is an axis, X is a variable, X is a chromosome, X is an energetic frequency of range of light, X is a molecular halogen, X multiplies, X is a unit, X is not owned, yet it is of our own making, and how we use it is yet to be defined on this episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know
Good science to you, Dr. Kiki. Good science to you too, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again in the wonderful 21st century to talk about all the amazing science that we were able to uncover this last week that we thought was interesting and we wanted to bring to discuss and share with you. So I hope you're all ready for a great show. Has it been a good week, Blair? Oh, yeah. Lots of yeah. science to talk about. Had to really figure out what I wanted to bring. Very excited. I know. It's all the things that you cut out, right? People want to know, what did you not want to talk about, Blair? No, it's what we want to talk about. That's the important one. Okay, on this week's show, I have stories about troubles with a muck, restoring fertility, fighting malaria, and why some people have more trouble with stairs than others. <laughs> what do you have in the animal corner? Oh my goodness. I have the invisible line you talked about. I have the Loch Ness monster, but not really. Ish. I wish I did. Um, and then in the actual animal corner proper, I have neon tetra fish that are very polite and uh, suspicious drongos. I don't even know what a drongo is, but Ooh. now I, I'm, should I be suspicious of the drongos? No, the drongos are suspicious. They're, they're, yeah, they are. They're concerned. <laughs> I okay. can't wait for you to find out what a Drago is. This is great. I want to learn about Drago's. Okay, but we have <laughs> to have <laughs> lots of other stories before we get there, which we're all ready to discuss right now. Okay, if you're not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us live streaming every Wednesday evening, 8 p.m.-ish uh, Pacific time on Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube. We are live right now on the air as I am speaking. And... If you want to catch us later as a podcast or other recordings, look for us places podcasts are found and on those aforementioned um, mentioned platforms. Look for this, this Week in Science. Look for TWIS. We are TWIS Science on some socials and on Twitch. And our website is twist.org where you can find links to things, show notes, all sorts of fun things. Anyway, it's now time for the science. What do you got, Kiki? Oh, well, first off, I guess I'm going to ruin a muck. Well, I personally, mean? yeah, I'm not personally ruining a muck, not running a muck. Humanity's running a muck. That's kind of what we do, apparently. This week was news from a, uh, a group who have warned of a possible slowing of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Current. And now there have been movies in which this has happened where suddenly the current that takes all the warmer water from further south brings it up north, it cools, and then it overturns, and there's this, this upwelling and downwelling and the movement of the water, which impacts the wonderful temperate climate of Europe so that Europe can have great agriculture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I right, right now it's getting a little bit hotter than maybe people would prefer it to be getting these days because of climate change. But one of the things that may possibly happen is that because we're heating the atmosphere so much and heating the oceans and increasing carbon dioxide, which is having a feedback effect to change pH and also impacting the heat trapping capacity of the atmosphere and the oceans, that the surface of the oceans uh, are getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And as they warm up, it's going to decrease the ability of that Atlantic Ocean meridional overturning circulation, otherwise known as a muck. It's going to decrease its ability to be a muck. There's no overturning if there's no temperature gradient. Temperature pressure gradients make the difference. So we've heard about this before. There have been movies that have uh, suggested that you know, there could be an, a stoppage of this current and then mm -hmm. an ice age comes and impacts North America and Europe and, oh my God, glaciation, which the last time, 12,000 years ago, that Europe had a glaciation, 
It was because a muck stopped. So it could be, you know, it's good. Yeah, could cool things down in Europe a little bit, but we don't want it to cool down so much that uh, agriculture is no longer possible and the ice sheets start uh, moving their way down from the, the great north onto the continent. So a lot of people are kind of questioning what's happening with this data. It was published in uh, Nature this last week, Nature Communications. Researchers uh, basically saying that the assessments from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, have been too... Uh, they're not going far enough, actually. And that observations are already suggesting that we're seeing evidence of a stoppage of amok right now, and that we're coming up on that threshold, the point at which it slows down really, really fast. And instead of, as the IPCC climate suggestions, the uh, climate estimates suggest, which it's a muck will not stop until after the end of the 21st century. These researchers think now based on their uh, statistical calculations of variance, that a muck could collapse between sometime uh, around 2025 to 2095. With, with That's the, soon. Yes, the <laughs> is, hey, we're already seeing cooling that is not lining up with the IPCC simulations. So they're already having observations that don't match the IPCC's most extreme simulations or estimate estimates. And so that's why they are suggesting that this is going to be a, a much uh, more rapid collapse than what is currently right. made. Which could mean a lot, but at the same time, it could be not a complete collapse all at once. Maybe it goes kind of step by step. So like it's a partial slowing and maybe it's, you know, maybe it doesn't go all at once. Um, other researchers think that the way that they have uh, looked at the data is not appropriate and that the IPCC is still the proper estimate. So there are a lot of questions as to what's happening here, but there are uh, researchers who write at uh, realclimate.org who have published papers on this current previously and um, have written up some great points about this that uh, that you might want to take a look at, and we'll link to it on our website. And they they link to a number of papers related to all this stuff. Um, but the the take home message is that a lot of researchers are looking at this and taking it very seriously, and that the IPCC's estimate of like uh, you know there's a maybe a ten percent chance of it happening within this century. You know, why aren't we looking at the likelihood or the statistical significance? It's something more like what we expect from the rest of science, which is our certainty levels are at like 99.95 or 99.99% right. statistical significance. We're not doing that. So it's kind of like, you know, you, you're, you, you're going to go into a room and there is a one in, one in 10 chance that you're going to open the door and you, there's going to be gases that'll kill you. Yeah. Right. You know, it's, would I mean, you open the door? It's <laughs> why do you wear a seatbelt? Yeah. What's the likelihood that you're gonna be in a fatal car crash? It's yeah. less than one in ten, actually. But it's still scary yeah. enough that we wear a seatbelt. And you should. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but that's exactly the point, right? Like we do yes. so many things to avoid something that is less likely than one in ten. We do. One in ten is actually not good. <laughs> no. I will also say it's. I feel like this is when I want to shout out to my um, environmental science teacher in high school who was talking to us about the Gulf Stream and how it would be reversed and and Europe would be thrown into an ice age and this was twenty something years ago and yeah and uh, I just I've been thinking about it ever since then. <laughs> so it's, it's actually a lot more uh, intense if the entire amok system is going to get messed up, not just the Gulf Stream, but. Right, um, not just this. This is talking about not just the Gulf Stream. They're talking about no. the Amok system, um, and and there are already 
temperature changes that we are measuring at the sea surface mm -hmm. that are indicative of uh, the predictions that are more dire than what IPCC is suggesting. Now, there are some research, so if you go look at the news and the way it's being covered, um, you know, it's like, okay, there's a really small chance it could be as early as 2025. Probably not going to happen. But, you know, within this century, is sooner than we were anticipating. We might not really be able to, I guess, really picture and conceptualize what the change of a, to a muck would mean for life in Europe and life on, you know, northern in the northern North, North America areas and how that could potentially change the Gulf Stream and all sorts of stuff. But we are already seeing heat changes that are definitely the result of climate change. Again, another group came out this week reporting on uh, their, uh, their assessment of extreme heat in Europe, North America, and China, and that it's the, what the temperatures that we've been seeing are much, much more likely because of climate change. And if it weren't because of climate change, that the, the temperatures are that we would be seeing, the, the highs of our heat waves would not be as high. So we can worry about heat, we can worry about a muck, but why not both? And how yes. about look at the, the planet as a system and let's try and figure out how we can do best for all of it, right? I mean, this is, this is why climate scientists have pushed the climate change rebrand from global warming so hard. Because it is so much more than warming. Yes, warming is part of it. And yes, it's like 114 degrees in Arizona or something today. But <laughs> it has been for like 25 days or so. It's like yeah. this, or it's like a 20 day stretch of over 110, which is yeah. amazing. I think it was 130 something in Death Valley today. Anyway, um, that's part of it. And that's bad. But your <laughs> freezing over is also bad. And also part of it. It's bad. It's a yeah. system. You mess up the system, things don't circulate right. And as much as we might, as humans, like to run amok on the planet's surface, we don't want to ruin amok. So let's try no. not to. We need it. <laughs> let's decrease our carbon dioxide output, everyone. And that doesn't necessarily mean just pulling carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We need to start figuring out how we use our energy, how we create products, how we are consumers, and how our industries are regulated. We got to work it and all together. Voting everybody. for politicians who support climate action and reduction of fossil fuels on a larger scale. You cannot yes. do it by yourself. You nope. have to get the support of your local governments. That is the only way. Sorry, you got to vote. You got to vote. <sighs> <sighs> don't ruin a muck vote but speaking of oceans you had another cool story related to a yes. mysterious boundary in the ocean yeah. mysterious Let's boundary about. potentially caused by climate change 35 million years ago <laughs> What? Um, there so, was climate change 35 well, million years ago. I mean, that was that was like normal, normal climate change. That was like the climate change as the result of, of weird tectonic activity, which I'm gonna get to in a minute. So there's this thing called the Wallace Line. It's uh it's in the Malay archipelago, which is a chain of more than 25,000 islands between Southeast Asia and Australia, which includes the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, Singapore, and many, many others. And um, the, this, this guy, Wallace, noticed that the species that he encountered was, they were, they were kind of the same, the same, the same, and then they were drastically different at a certain point. So there was this strange boundary that he got named after him called the Wallace Line. Since then, it's kind of been redrawn to, to reflect current findings because, you know, a, a scientist on a boat, it is a contemporary of Charles Darwin, didn't have perfect data. <laughs> but since then, they found that, you know, aside from a slight redrawing of the line, the line stands. So on the Asian side of the line, the creatures exclusively originate from Asia. Once you cross this line, bam, there's a mixture of Asian and Australian animals there are no crossovers of australian animals above it but asian animals can move below it so there's something huh. weird 
where Asian animals can move one direction, but Australian species cannot move the other. So there's there's some weird, uh, sort of weird selective pressure happening that will not allow any animals from Australia to cross this line. Um, recent study looked at the uh, kind of more contemporary expectation that it had to do with uh, climactic differences on either side of this line. And so the reason that the climate is so different on the two different sides of this line, they think actually has to do with tectonic activity from around 35 million years ago. That's when Australia broke away from Antarctica and crashed into Asia, which made this archipelago. They used a computer model to simulate how animals were impacted by the different climactic effects. And they factored in dispersal, ecological preferences, evolutionary relatedness, all the stuff of about 20,000 species. And they found that Asian species just were much better suited for living in the archipelago at the time. So basically, the Asian species had evolved already to be um, more flexible. And the Australian species were less flexible. And so, um, you know, that, that kind of tracks with what we know about Australian species it's an it's island biogeography. It's there's a bunch of there are a bunch of weirdos. And the reason <laughs> Australian species are so weird is that they were separated, they became specialized for a very specific habitat, and they never went anywhere else. And that was it. They had no other selective pressures. And so this kind of follows that line. So um the climate in Southeast Asia and the newly formed archipelago was much warmer, wetter than Australia, which was cold and dry. And as a result, the Asian animals were well adapted to live on the islands, were able to use them as stepping stones to move all the way towards Australia. But then these uh, Australian species, they were less successful at going tropical because they were used to this dry, cold habitat. And so um, this explains this kind of weird phenomenon, but ultimately also it gives us tools to look at how to forecast modern day climate change and how that will impact species. So it's it's kind of more, it's more data to put into uh, species flexibility studies, essentially, to hmm. see who's going to be able to adjust and adapt to changing climates and who will not. And so um, my guess is that uh, Australia is not looking so good. <laughs> <laughs> that the animals there, they're great for what they have been adapted for. But yeah. if it changes, it's not going to do so well. That said, they, Australia yeah. itself does have a very varied uh, layout of habitats and ecosystems. You've got, you know, the the outback. You've got more tropical regions. You've got there is a lot of variance, but maybe there's a lot, a yeah. uh, lot less generalization within the species. Right. Well, and if yeah. you if you look at a lot of the animals that have survived on Australia, they are. They, they always like to use words like primitive, but that's not right. They they are um, of a more ancestral morphology, I would say, than animals that you see in the rest of the world. Um, although I will also say that we had a study uh, a couple months ago that said that marsupials might actually not be the default that, that was the precursor to placental mammals. So who knows? Maybe I'm totally wrong about that, it turns out. <laughs> but, but that's it's what not, the, that's what the, that's what the study told said, us. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So and that's if like the, that is of the, the case. Yeah. Then Australian animals kind of have these older traits, evolutionarily speaking, because they didn't have the same selective pressures from being on the mainland. In which case, they are generally less flexible, which would follow the results of this study. Right. So it's <laughs> it, it would make sense, but I am just throwing out there that there it was called into question recently whether all the marsupials in Australia are in fact um, a more ancestral lineage or not. I, I don't know. But regardless, uh, that, that kind of explains this Wallace line and, and gives us some interesting things to look at for the pressures of climate change. Yeah. I wonder though, you know, with the suggestion that potentially there will be different glaciations, there will be because of climate change. It's not just like you said, global warming, right? There's going to be localized changes. There are going to be 
changes in water level, right? So the ocean level, sea level is going to rise in some places, not in others because of the way that gravitational shifts are going to uh, influence the, the compression of the Earth's crust and, and other facets of how it moves. And, you know, it's going to just be very interesting to see which places maintain kind of a status quo, which become different than they ever were. Like here in the Pacific Northwest, we're starting to see more weather that's hotter, that's more like Southern climates as we go further on. Um, but then will we see stuff like a muck shutting down that will lead to an ancient kind of uh, need for a phenotype or, you know, something that you yeah. would consider quote unquote more primitive, but could be very well adapted to a particular right. type of place and time. Right. Yeah. And what, what animals are going to be able to move and Island hop and figure out how to kind of get into a spot that they're comfortable with and what animals will not. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I do feel kind of sad about some of the, wonderful Australian species not being able to make their way out. But others, I'm absolutely fine with them staying wherever Australia ends up. <laughs> um, I, like I, the, the, I'm the, having some thoughts. Yeah, the venomous ones and, yeah, the dangerous ones. Just yeah. Be They're specialized. part of their ecosystem, but you're right. I don't need them in my backyard. Oh, you can't make it? Oh, that's too bad. Okay. Oh, shucks. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do I feel bad? No, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be interesting to see what would happen um, should Australia become colder and be affected yeah. more greatly by those kinds of climates. Not speaking of uh, ancient reproductive capacity and fitness and ability to evolve, but uh, speaking on uh, a level of reproduction and fertility in humans. But of course, in this study, it's a study on mice because we can't really study, study the things that we're studying unless we study them in other species first. And so it's da, 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 always, and mice. Got it. And mice, yes. Um, this work is uh, very interesting because there are a large number of people who undergo ovary, ovary degradation, whether it's from chemotherapy or from other disorders or uh, you know genetic issues. But over time, there's about 5% of people with ovaries who have issues with being able to be reproductive, that their ovaries decline in fitness. And this is not just a problem for reproduction, because when the ovaries start to decline in their function, they also stop producing lots of essential hormones that are important for bone strength and for uh, like physical function and brain function. And so the ovaries are very, very impactful to the physiology overall for people with ovaries. And when they start to uh, start to not work as well, things, things aren't great. It's hard to do with it. So what would it be like if we could repair people's ovaries after they've been destroyed by chemotherapy or damaged by chemotherapy? Wouldn't that be amazing? That'd so be researchers, awesome. yeah, researchers are working on this. And one uh, thing that they have recently done, just published in the Lancet eBioMedicine, is their study on using induced pluripotent stem cells. That they have taken, in this case, from mouse ovaries, the stem cells that are called granulosa cells. These, they can turn into the ovary cells, the cells of the ovary. Uh, they've taken the granulosa cells, turned them into induced pluripotent stem cells, and then taken those. And induced pluripotent stem cells, they could become any type of stem, of stem cell, but they're making them turn into ovary cells because it's kind of, there's this weird programming that's kind of embedded in there somewhere where it's like, oh, you're, you're from an ovary? We, you still want to become an ovary. We could turn you into skin, but we're just going to have you become an ovary. That's great. So they did that. They injected these ovarian cells into mice and in the work that they did and they published, they were able to uh, take these non-reproductive cells, the stem cells, the granulosa cells, 
and turn them into functional eggs. They were able to create have the mice with non-functioning ovaries go on to reproduce. The stem cells were implanted. They worked as they should. They turned into ovarian cells. The ovarian cells were then able to support egg cells and the egg cells were then able to go on and produce offspring. That's amazing. Yes. Yes. And it was able, they had multiple generations of animals. They went several generations down the line to see if there were genetic abnormalities or any issues from the stem cell implantation. And there were not any that they could see. And so this is a proof of principle for moving forward into possible human trials in the future. Wow. Yeah. So making, making a stem cell into an egg I recognize this is like a very Medicaid. specific pathway, but that is a big deal. Yeah, but this isn't just making a stem cell into the egg. This is restructuring, re like rebuilding an ovary that has been dying back, that was basically, you know, deteriorated or almost dead because of genetic issues or because of something like chemotherapy. And it's like, we will rebuild it. You know, it's like, I don't yeah. know the bionic woman but stem cells it's a stem cell stem cell ovary um yeah and so these ovaries were able to then go to inducing oocytes which are the egg cells and the yeah. oocytes were then able to become little little mice love it yeah wow that's uh we've come very far <laughs> i know right <laughs> This is a big deal. I don't I don't really have anything intelligent to say about it. This is just a big deal. <laughs> it's a pretty big big accomplishment that researchers have been working on for a long time. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Wow. Yeah, so the possibilities of uh, you know, there are a lot of people who don't know that, you know, they can save their eggs or there's not you know you're gonna go undergo chemotherapy or whatever a lot of people don't hear about those things and then they have no choices and now this or they don't have any, the insurance that does it at the time yeah and this you is know. this is the kind of thing that will allow people to you know reproduce and to be you know to have the things that they want that yeah. they need internally and if it like i said also it's not just about re reproduction it's about having functioning ovaries that produced estrogen right. or estradiol right. and other steroid hormones and are important for physiological function and so that in itself is also an incredible deal wow. like instead of you know maybe you have a hysterectomy and have uh, also mm -hmm. maybe your ovaries won't are suggested to be removed for whatever reason, but maybe you're able to rebuild them. And so then you don't have all of the, de the deficits that come with having had a, com you know, all of that removed from, from yeah. your physiology. Or you go into super early um, menopause. menopause. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. It's very exciting. So, you know, we'll see where's this going to go down the line. It looks promising and it's great. We were able to solve a problem in mice yet again. <laughs> Do you want to talk about uh, your monster? -ish? I, I thought you'd never ask. I'm, um, really hey, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. The Loch Ness Monster. Is it real? No. No. But no. No. Um, where the cryptozoology hits actual zoology is where many researchers over many generations have tried to figure out what people are seeing. What are they photographing? What are they seeing? What, what is, where does this lore come from? Is there an animal in the lock that could inspire these stories? One of the predominant theories is that it is a giant eel that would sure. be a really really big eel that's the thing how big great question so um 
this research uh, was looking at uh, eel catch in Loch Ness to try to figure out if any eels ever could have possibly been big enough to be mistaken for the Loch Ness monster. And so uh, they used previous estimates of the monster's size. And then they used this eel catch data um, to try to figure out if this is at all possible. No, <laughs> there's no eels big enough in Loch Ness. <laughs> um, they they, they ca calculated the chances of encountering a one meter eel, which is approximately one in 50,000. Which could explain some sightings of smaller things that people see in the lock or the smaller version of the Loch Ness monster. But the big guy, that that big Nessie situation, probability is basically zero. There is no way eels could account for these larger sightings. So purely statistical considerations do not support the existence of exceptionally large eels in Loch Ness. And therefore, Nessie is not an eel. <laughs> All right. What so, could she be? I don't know. <laughs> so not European eels. Not eels from that Sargasso Sea area that got stuck in Loch Ness at some point. Not there's no no way that could have happened. No, Is no, this... it just really based on based on this modeling and and this catch data. Nope, can't be it. So it's got to be something else. What what if it was like an eel ball? Like what if it was mating season and it was like a bunch of eels? Right, but maybe it's not eels at all, but big fish that have a yeah. similar behavior like that. that what if it's a log? <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, at a certain time of night and a certain kind yeah. of water, the water reflecting in a particular way, it just, you know, definitely seems like it has a long neck and head extending above the surface. I will tell you. Surface. I walk on the Bay Trail every night. And yeah. When in the in the kind of uh, fall winter when it's kind of twilighty and I'm walking and I see reflections on the water, I have seen what looks, I swear, like an alligator. <laughs> I know it's not because I'm in the San Francisco Bay. There's no alligators there. There's, um, there shouldn't be anyway. Yeah, it's a log. Sometimes <laughs> I'll see what I swear is an otter, which is possible. Usually a it's log. True. Sometimes I'll see what I am sure is a sea lion You're like oh my gosh there's a sea lion here log possible i can't but, uh, but almost always a log, log. <laughs> <laughs> i you know Ooh. so my money my money for nessie is that she's a log but um we know for sure based on eel catch data the science tells us not an eel so there you go not an eel okay not so eel. we've checked that possibility off nessie's down. not an eel could be an actual monster i suppose but whatever or a, lo or a log or a log <laughs> my money's on log <laughs> it's log it's log mm, anyone who gets that old reference i don't I have to tell you the next the next phrase but i am aware of it <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. It's better than bad. It's good, right? Yes, right? there you go. Yep. <laughs> it's good. It's better than bad. It's good. Anyway, moving on down the line of stories away from the fun idea of thinking of cryptozoological possibilities in Loch Ness, not eels. Um, let's move on to things that are not so crypto, but actually zoological and that actually are posing problems around the world, like malaria, the plasmodium parasite, which causes malaria, carries the, ma the malaria and causes all sorts of problems. Plasmodium 
this paramecium. It comes and it's injected into your bloodstream, usually when you're bitten by a mosquito. 80s Egyptes is one of the nasty ones that we don't like for that one. Um, Malaria, there have been cases in Florida recently. Climate change is making malaria more prevalent in areas of the southern United States, and we're likely to see it spread within the northern hemisphere even further as we can say, thank you, climate change. And we could stop it by stopping climate change. But anyway, let's go back to malaria and the fact that people have been trying for years and years and years to figure out how to treat it well, and also how to possibly prevent it, because it is such a global problem. There have been efforts at uh, vaccines, and we currently now have a vaccine that is at is better than nothing. It's it's not the best vaccine. It doesn't, it's not 100% effective. It's actually not you know, for the comparison of other vaccines that we get here in the United States, it's probably not even as effective as the flu vaccine in, in terms of how well it works. However, it's more than was had before. And so it's being, uh, it, it's actually working and doing good throughout the world. But researchers are still working to discover more possible vaccines. And in this work, Collaborators from Victoria University of Wellington's Farrier Research Institute and the Mal Maligan Institute of Medical Research in New Zealand and the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity in Australia have been looking at mRNA-based vaccines. And one thing to know about malaria is that it gets injected into your bloodstream and then those little paramecium, these par the plasmodium parasite likes to go to your liver and hang out in the liver and the eggs, the cysts, they grow and develop within the liver before then emerging again and causing the, the larger illness. And so the researchers in trying to develop this particular uh, vaccine with MNR, mRNA, initially it failed because they were just targeting a protein that was within the malaria uh, or plasmodium genome. They got a they got one protein. They were going to work on use that one, and it it didn't do much. And so, in their next efforts, they uh, kept looking and they found what's called an adjuvant. And adjuvants are additions to vaccines that make them work better, be more effective. And in this case, it was an adjuvant that helped the mRNA vaccine go specifically to the liver and pretty much only be active in the liver. And in doing that, it it uh, the mRNA vaccine creates immune cells, CD8 T cells and others that are then like memory cells that have a memory against this protein for malaria within the liver, which is where this parasite goes to build its resources and get, get better at doing its, you know, what it does, but in fact hurting you. And so instead of focusing on having floating memory cells that are in the blood that don't do as much good, which is how other vaccines have been working so far, it is specifically focused within the liver. It's highly focused. And they were able to uh, basically harness this mRNA uh, platform to halt malaria in the animals they were studying in. And this is in uh, Nature Immunology that they have published their paper. Um, they showed in mice, this addition of the uh, adjuvant, the agonist, it recruits T cells from type one natural killer T cells under these uh, mRNA vaccination conditions and produces uh, specific cells against a protein in the liver and keeps the mice from getting infected with malaria. So could you call this a weird silver lining from COVID <laughs> because of mRNA vaccines use and testing? Or do you think this was well on the tracks already and it's not really related? I'm going to say it's probably... 
this is probably something that was being looked at, but I'm going to guess that it wasn't well on the tracks. The researchers in uh, this particular instance, they turned to mRNA in about 2018. So it was prior to the COVID pandemic, but it right. it's probably because of what has been learned with respect to COVID and, um, and also other uh, diseases that right. mRNA vaccines are being used for, yeah. such as, um, you know, such as like cancer. And I think, yeah, there are quite a few. I mean, uh, yeah. HIV AIDS, I think there's some mRNA work being done. There's a lot that's being, being applied right now. And so I th feel like the money that was probably put into supporting the research efforts for mRNA vaccines during the, the effort to get vaccines out for COVID-19, that has benefited all of this incredibly. Great. Yeah, because yeah. I know, I mean, the only reason we got an mRNA vaccine for COVID was because there were so many different paths of research for it happening already. Yeah. Uh, but it really did allow just an amazing data set of uh of of just real life application of mrna vaccines in a way that um i think probably sped this stuff along a lot faster than it would have gone otherwise so i think so um, it's yeah. neat to see it kind of and i hesitate to call it a silver lining because <laughs> covid was terrible and yeah so many people died and we're still stuck in a dystopian future because of it. But, <laughs> but how but many, weirdly, how many groups, yeah. yeah, how many groups would have had, have, have had maybe uh, the MRNA technology set up in their labs? How many people would be aware of it as a platform for advancement? Like maybe it would have taken another five, 10 years, you know, maybe this is something that would have gone more yeah. slowly. So I think yes, silver lining, but, yeah. Also, it was on it. It, it would be yeah. It would be nice to see some lives saved after all this because of what we learned from all that. Yeah. Uh, two of the really interesting aspects of this study also is that other vaccines don't work as well sometimes when people have been previously exposed to malaria. So a lot of the the vaccines out there. Um, they don't work as well because people have had malaria before, and it's so it makes it hard for the vaccine to actually have an impact. Um, and in this particular case, with their animal models, even rodents that had been pre-exposed to malaria had a really big uh, response to the this mRNA vaccine. Um, and so that that is a huge, huge thing. So I don't know, still need to get to human trials yet again. This is in mice. We've done of wonderful course. stuff in mice. So this can be many years to come, but it's you know, I don't know. We're looking at 10 years, five, 10 years before malaria becomes really endemic within North America and people really start to care about it. Yikes. <laughs> it's just a bummer that it, people don't care about it now when a lot of people are getting it currently. Oh, just not. Yeah, that's my. States. Yeah, that's my tongue in cheek yeah. right there. <laughs> yes, yes. No, absolutely. It's so frustrating. And it's also scary. Yeah. That uh, we, yeah, we we probably will get it here because of climate change and and all that good stuff. And but they, yeah, if we just gave a toot now, then uh, right. we'd benefit later. Hello, hello, yes, yes. We, we help each. We help our neighbors, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Help our neighbors. Yes. So anyway, really worried about your own personal benefit. There will be some later. <sighs> I don't like talking about personal benefit and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Unless it's talking about how people are going to personally benefit from watching or listening to twists. So thank you very much for being a part of the show this week. This is This Week in Science, and we are so glad to be here talking about really interesting science news stories with you and hearing what you have to say. I love seeing your comments in the chat room, although currently, apparently it's all about soccer. Um, but we are continuing on with this show. And if you would like to support the show, you can head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. Patreon is how we are listener supported. And we really can't do it without you. So your help 
no matter whether it's $5, $10, $15 a month, any amount helps. And you can choose your level of support over at the Patreon interface. And we just really appreciate you being a part of helping us do this for you. We really can't do it without you. All right, we're going to come back now for more of what we love to do, which at this time is to talk about things going on in Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels and a What you got, Blair? I have two stories that I was very excited to bring and uh, very excited to read all about. And then, and now you're when not. I dug deeper. <laughs> I had some issues with the mechanics. So okay, let's. So we're going to talk about it because they're they're both they sound very intriguing. Um, but that's kind of the theme this week is is like does that is that actually what that means? So here we go. So uh, first study: uh, neon tetrafish line up to escape a small opening. <laughs> okay, so schools of neon tetrafish, uh, Paracuridon in in Nessie, they will queue up to evacuate through narrow spaces when um, when they are in a hurry, and they will do so without clogging or colliding. So, um, researchers observed neon tetras evacuate in groups of 30 through a narrow opening in a tank. The the opening ranged from 1.5 to 4 centimeters. And they were doing it because uh, the researchers were kind of pretending to try to scoop them up with a net. So, basically scaring them through the hole. Right. Um, So, the neon tetras themselves measure about 0.5 centimeters wide and 3 centimeters long. So, Definitely can't all go through at once. They found that the fish evacuated at faster rates through larger openings than smaller openings. Okay, so they're slower as a group to go through the smaller openings. But that fish evacuating through all sizes tended to do so at a constant rate. The exception was that the last few fish in each group would all kind of go slowly, which I guess that's just natural selection. (laughs) They're going to get eaten is my guess. Um, So uh, they, they all gathered around openings of all sizes prior to passing through them, but they didn't bump into each other at all. There was no physical contact. So I guess this is where they're calling it kind of queuing up is that uh, because they didn't bump into each other or clog up or, or try to squeeze through next to each other. They were, they were polite. They were waiting their turn. And so um, their findings indicate that they may wait or queue before evacuating through narrow openings in order to maintain a preferred social distance and avoid clogging. Uh, In previous studies, they've seen similar behavior from ants. But uh, for example, humans and sheep do not do this behavior. They will all try to squish through at once. If you've ever been in an elevator or uh, a, a crowded subway stop, or in, yeah, in Japan, no. yeah, getting on the subway in Japan, terrifying. Except actually, mm-hmm. they have markers for lines so that they don't do that. But yeah, it, oh, you scary. know, it depends. It depends on the situation. Uh, but Locker anyway, um, right. so the authors suggest that they think that this would reflect the behaviors of schools of wild neon tetras when they pass between rocks and rivers to escape predators, stuff like that. Um, and so, um. I get it. It makes sense to me. Um, I think a lot more study is needed. I definitely think they need to look at this in the wild. You can't just assume that this is going to happen the exact same way, especially when you're using a net, which is basically like a wall. (laughs) It's not just a threat. It's you must move this way. Like if the net makes any physical contact with fish, you're not testing what you think you're testing. Anyway, (laughs) so there's that. Um, but I also think that, that queuing up, that forming a line is not the same thing as just not mobbing. Yeah. And it it sounds like there's an allocation of something that's way more complicated to what's going on other than just fish school. Fish are very good at not running into each other. 
It's like their whole thing. They're right. They're very aware of their neighbors and how their neighbors are moving. And that's actually part of their survival within schools of fish. That movement. Right. right. Yeah. Whereas, Whereas uh, humans, herds of sheep, don't... for example, will, will constantly make contact with each other. Yeah. So it's yes. Anyway, I think it's cool. I think I really appreciate that the neon Tetras didn't all try to squeeze through at the same time. But um, I, I definitely think that more research is needed. And of course, the icing on the cake with this is that what's the uh, proposed use of these findings? You got it. To inform the development of swarm robots. Those are words I don't like hearing together. Wait, what? Um, not wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, yes. hold on. Hold on, hold yes. on. So, not to help make exits from human event spaces. No. <laughs> No, no, no. That's the second thing that they say, as well as traffic management methods for autonomous cars. That's actually the second thing. The third thing they say is human crowd. uh, But why swarm robots first? Come on. Thank you. Why? (laughs) Why are the swarm robots first? No, thank you. Um, (laughs) It's anyway. Autonomous cars also. You got to. You guys haven't figured out how to teach the cars how to line up? Because that, if you really haven't figured that out yet, I'm scared. Because there are self-driving cars currently on the road. Oh, yeah. A lot so of them. So, yes. this part out yet, I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, my. I, I think it interesting also, you know, that... It, it's definite that it's swarm behavior and it's assuming that each individual, like you mentioned earlier, like, like that each individual is exactly the same. And so is, you know, making specific judgments based on, you know, proximity or, you know, other stimuli, but watching, there's a video that shows how the fish move through and it doesn't look like they're lined up as no. they're moving through. And it looks like some fish all. are like, I, I don't care. I, what? No. Oh, okay. And they end up getting kind of pushed through and mm-hmm. it wasn't something I tried to do in the first place. And there are some fish that go through kind of lined up together, others that mush together. And it seemed like it was a lot more varied behavior than yes. they're trying to make it sound. I agree. And when I first saw that video that came with the study, I thought that was like the before video. I thought that was going to be, here's what happens with a big hole. And then we make it small. Now let's watch them line up. No, that was just the whole video. (laughs) (laughs) We need more videos. I want to see more. I need more. I, I just think they need to do more. They just need to tag a bunch of fish and record their movements in the wild and yeah. see how they respond to predators. I think that's that's all you need to do is how did these fish escape through these holes in the rock? Was it orderly? Or were they getting out of there as fast as they could? Because also a net is not an eel. (laughs) Bring it back to eels again, right? Like a net is not the same thing as something that's going to eat you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a totally different barrier. It's not a threat. So it, anyway, (laughs) so Kevin, fish might line up. Who knows? Who knows? Kevin Reardon saying we will need swarm robots to replace bees. Well, and possibly mm. neon tetras. I don't. I guess I don't know. Do oh, the yeah. do the robot bees need to swarm? That sounds unnecessary. <laughs> right, the bee swarms are only to follow the queen, yeah. right, and to form a new colony. So, That's yeah. That seems okay. scary and unnecessary. Anyway, swarm robots. <laughs> Yikes. Um, let's talk about drongos. Okay, and now let's... I need expo- ex- explanation? It's a explication? bird, Gigi! It's a bird! Oh, why don't I know uh, about this? Drongos range from Africa to Central Asia, Australia, and the Western Pacific Islands. There are lots of kinds of drongos. They inhabit forests, open country, gardens... They, um, they're, a lot of them are really stunning. So there's, um, the greater racket tailed drongo, which like has these two, like, uh, all tail feathers that are 
almost like pinpricks. They're super thin, and then they end in a big old feather at the end. Um, there I, are I'm sitting here with my my mouth hanging open right now because they're so cool. These they're are great very words. cool okay. looking. They have little tufts on the front of their head. They're stunning. They're absolutely stunning. That's not what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> I'm here to talk about the fact that uh, specifically fork-tailed drongos in Africa are often uh, the target of brood parasitism by African cuckoos, our buddies, the cuckoos. So they'll go, they'll lay an egg in a drongo nest so that they don't have to rear the chick themselves. And then if the uh, imposter egg goes undetected, then the cuckoo will hatch it'll be much larger than the baby drongos it will eat all the baby drongos and then the mom and dad drongos will care for the cuckoo so that's the classic cuckoo story we've talked about it a million times but what this particular piece of research uh that came out this week is all about is the idea that drongos have signatures so basically um Drongo eggs vary. They have a lot of different colors and patterns. And so um, those are usually forged by the cuckoo. They can kind of copy them. But the drongos, their, their kind of flavor of egg is very personal and specific. And so the researchers suggest that the drongos have their own kind of signature. So just like I sign my name different from anyone else. Drongos have their own color and pattern on their eggs that are specific to them. They are unique to them and they are repeatable by the same individual. And so potentially they can use that to identify eggs that are not theirs. And that picture that you just showed is what a young cuckoo looks like. So those. I think they are so cute. They're really I cute. Mean... Too bad they kill baby birds. <laughs> But it's how they survive. So, yes, of course. You know, it, it's a it's cute fittest, bully. right? Survival, survival of the fittest. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, you little survival cutie with your big eyes. Mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, uh, so yes. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the suggestion of this study is that drongos have their signature. Their eggs are very specific. They can tell a cuckoo egg apart. Now, this is where the story starts to lose me because. Okay. If that were true, how do cuckoos still exist and do they still lay eggs in drongo nests? If they're getting caught, how does this behavior continue? So let me get and into it. They're not getting caught enough is, is the thing, right? Great question. So... um University of Cambridge and University of Cape Town worked in collaboration with a community in Zambia. They explored the effectiveness of signatures, as they call them, as a defense against this mimicry. And um, they found that despite near perfect mimicry of drongo eggs, African cuckoo eggs have a high probability of being rejected. How do they measure the probability of being rejected? Did they go in the wild and see which eggs were rejected? No. <laughs> Uh, they carried out field work in Zambia uh, across four years. They measured the differences in color and pattern of the fork-tailed drawn goat eggs and the cuckoo eggs. They found that the color and pattern of the cuckoo eggs were almost identical to the drawn goat eggs. Sounds like cuckoos are nailing it. The broad types of drawn goat egg signatures were forged by cuckoos, so cuckoos could kind of tailor the egg that they popped out based on what the other ones looked like in the nest. So the second step of their study, they simulated cuckoo visits by parasitizing drongo nests with foreign eggs from other drongo nests. Ooh. That was their proxy for African cuckoo eggs. This is where the study loses me because you are completely changing the variable. Yeah, it's not a cuckoo egg anymore. It's, it's a, a drongo, drongo egg. egg. Which yeah. the whole point of this study is saying that each drongo has a specific signature. So then they checked the nest 
Haley to see whether the Drongo parents accepted the foreign egg or if they realized it was imposter and rejected it by removing it from their nest. They could then test what differences in color and pattern between the foreign egg and the Drongo eggs best predicted whether or not the Drongo parents were tricked. So basically, th what they're doing is they're using the, these foreign Drongo eggs. If they're rejected, they're figuring out why, and then they're applying that to cuckoo eggs. So it, it sounds almost like they, they, over, they made things too difficult for themselves, but <laughs> ultimately, in order to try to control what was happening, they tried to identify what about the eggs made them successful or not. They then created a mathematical model to predict how often on average cuckoos would have its egg, would have their eggs rejected. And they predicted rate of rejection was 93.7%. Which is super high. That There's would... no way cuckoos can survive that. That species no, cannot then, cope. Because then you've got, you know, 90 96% ish of 96.3% I mean sorry 6.3% of those survivors then having to be young baby birds surviving in a nest and then surviving yes. to adulthood yes. to then pass on their own egg to a nest yes yeah. yes and then they have to beat those those 6.3% odds that their eggs can it's impossible it is impossible that this brood parasitism could continue with that low of a success rate so um their additional simulations show it's likely because these drongos have these signatures on their eggs and so even though cuckoos have evolved forgeries they don't have enough of a match of their own eggs but again we don't know that because they didn't test cuckoo eggs Right, they tested Drongo eggs. Right. And so this is where I think it's really funny. The results of the study suggest that a female cuckoo may only fledge two chicks in her lifetime, only just replacing herself and her mate. Researchers say that this would not amount to a sustainable population, hmm. which presents a puzzle because African cuckoos remain a common bird in many parts of Africa. So um, their their suggestion to explain this is that the fork-tailed drongos where the research took place could be particularly good at spotting forgeries. So they think that this population is just really good at it. And that perhaps this part of Zambia is a hot spot for parasitism where drongos have particularly fine two defenses. And so cuckoos stand little chance. Or your um, research method was flawed. <laughs> Which is... I, I, you're, I, I'm questioning that uh, you're coming up with this criticism and the, the published study got published without it being a criticism to begin know. with. It's know. maybe, maybe I'm not, I don't have the whole story here, but based on the information I've been given, it seems like you could also just observe wild drongo nests and see which ones cuckoos laid eggs in. Mm -hmm. And check the success rate. See what and, kind of and... uh, eggshells are in the nest yeah. or outside the nest. You don't even yeah. have to disturb the nest. You look at the ground and see no. what is on the ground around the nest. Yes. Um, yeah. So, I mean, from previous research, not specifically with the drongo, but with cuckoos generally, there's been some fascinating work related to this like predator prey um, co evolution that's gone on where. Right you have specific cuckoo species or uh, cuckoo populations that because they live in a particular area where a, another particular population or multiple populations of uh, parasitized birds also exist, that the cuckoos start to create the molecular, like they have the molecular signatures to be able to create the shells that look like the birds that they are going to parasitize. So there's this, the fingerprinting itself is, is an evolutionary war that they are mm -hmm. going toward this point of being able to really replicate the eggs of the parasitized species. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, if you're taking a completely different individual Drongo's egg where it has a different fingerprint, you're going to have rejection of that more often than something that has been specialized to look as close to the fingerprint of your yes. egg as possible. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that oh. kind of the step one of this study, totally valid. Drongo egg mm -hmm. to Drongo egg, unique. Yes, great. This idea of signatures, I'm totally on board. Individual Drongos have their own little like flare that comes out that's on their cool. eggs. That's their brand. Oh. That's what my eggs look like. And I uh. think that is awesome. And that may have developed to try to deal with the cuckoo problem. Most likely. And it, that is yeah, and it's very part likely. of this yeah. arms race that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But the idea that 93% of them could be kicked out. It's, and that cuckoos would still survive in that area. Yeah. 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 Something's missing here. Yeah. But but yes, it is very cool that Drongos have signatures on their eggs. <laughs> and uh <laughs> and cuckoos have figured out a way to outsmart it, which is my takeaway from this study. And that researchers have not yet discovered a smart enough way to address it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Research wise. Ah, stop screen sharing. Ah. Yeah, I love I love stuff related to cuckoos and the whole nest parasitism. It's so once you start digging into it, it's such an oh, yeah. intricate, complex interaction between different species, you know, in an ecosystem, trying to figure out how it's going to work. And like you were saying, you have like these drongos with very specific egg fingerprints, and then you have the cuckoos who are going around and probably like looking at a number of individuals and going, okay, who's timed with me and whose yeah. nest can I put an egg into? And if I'm mm -hmm. going to put it in your nest, okay. You know, do they have the ability to create a number of different fingerprint eggs? Yeah. Like, is are they like, like a 3d printer where they're yes. like, all right, let me just scan this. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm going to make I, my egg look like these other eggs. Yeah. How does that work? Or do out? they know what their signature looks like? And are they picking the nest that looks like what their eggs look like? Are they exactly. aware of that? Yes. Yeah. And, and how are they aware of that? Because they're right. dropping and leaving. Right. Those those yeah. parents are not hanging out because they don't want the other birds to know that they were there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Fascinating systems. Yeah. Yeah. There's how lots of cool stuff tonight? to look at. Also, just Google Drongos later if you're listening to this and you haven't done it yet. Just check out what Drongos are like. They're super cool. And a lot of them do like weird mimicking calls and they're they're very neat birds. Anyway. Blair, you have opened up a bird rabbit hole for me. I'm so yes. excited. <laughs> it's like ah, a bird nest, I'm if you will. It's a bird. It's a very, very hopefully not spiky <laughs> bird nest. Oh yeah, spiky. <laughs> hopefully not too spiky. All right. I've got some fun research that I yeah, it's mostly I've got three really interesting, fun stories to talk about that I, I want to end the show with. Um, let's talk about why some people have more trouble with stairs than others. Um, some people trip and fall down or upstairs more than other people who are able-bodied and able to take stairs. And I'm not talking about people who are have differently abled. I'm talking about people who are able-bodied, able to take stairs. Some people just have stair trouble and it's like, what's going on there? So of course, researchers were like, hey, let's you know, study this and publish it in PLOS One. And so this is how we now have a study entitled Risky Behavior During Stair Descent for Young Adults, Differences in Men Versus Women. Oh, of course. So... Their research looking at uh, young adult pedestrians, 2,400 of them, 1,470 men, 930 women. They videotaped them on a college campus during no. descent on two different staircases. Oh, no. A short staircase of two steps and a long staircase of 17 steps. And then the researchers coded they had codes for like what happened like risky behavior kind of things what were people doing while they were going down the stairs <sighs> things were they like on their phones <sighs> using an electronic device there not using the handrail being in an in-person conversation having your hands in your pockets oh um, no don't do that <laughs> wearing sandals or high heels sure, yeah. was another one skipping steps 
is oh. another one. <laughs> So man, skipping that, steps going down is ballsy. <laughs> <laughs> skipping steps going up, that's fine. Uh, yeah. So the results of this study found that women were more likely to have be engaging in so-called risky behavior on staircases okay. than men. But did they fall more? Yeah, the oh. women were injured more. <laughs> more okay. often it's the high <laughs> heels and the petticoats and the bustles obviously they get in the way the hoop skirts you know uh, they, uh, i mean overall the number of injuries and falls out of those 2400 stair descents um they had uh, uh the number of co-occurring risky behaviors is higher in women so uh 1.9 to 2.3 uh Five pedestrians lost balance but didn't fall. Four of the pedestrians lost balance on the top step. All five had their gaze diverted from the step at the time their balance was lost. And uh, these observed behavior behaviors might be related to the higher rate of injuries on stairs in young adults. Oh, hold on, hold on. Young 2, adults. 2,400 descents. Yeah, really. Five injuries? Yeah, not even injuries, just losing balance. Five. Apparently five. Five out of 2,400. Yes. That's That That doesn't math. <laughs> <laughs> That's not statistically significant. <laughs> um, well, there are statistics. <laughs> We're statistic-y. Um. <laughs> okay, that just doesn't seem... You need more data. That's not... What? No, okay. So they found that women were significantly less likely to use the handrail. Uh, no participants used the handrail on the two-step staircase, though. Uh, women were more likely to be holding something in their hands or to be oh, engaged sure. in conversation, to wear sandals or high heels, and so also had uh, the higher number of those behaviors co-occurring than men did. Interesting. <sighs> Okay. I yeah, I don't I don't know about that. I I need more. I need more data. I think that we need a lot more. I find it interesting that the researchers add the young women we observed demonstrated more risky behaviors than the young men. Future studies should also examine physiological differences that may lead to greater injury risk oh, such as sure. differences in strength or reaction time. Okay. We know that's bunk though. How many studies have to happen that prove that that's not real? Right. I mean, this goes to sports. This goes to so uh, many things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All anyway, right. I'm, I'm going to say that they probably saw a number of these things happening, these risky behaviors, but the number of actual injuries they observed were very, very low. And so I find it questionable that they would even be able to have a statistical significance in that sample set. And in my own anecdotal observation of uh, risky behavior on stairs in my household versus uh, balance lost, I would say that the men are more prone to these troubles than women. <laughs> Go back one. I'm, I'm curious about the handrail thing, too, because I think handrail use. During trade, yeah, handrail use, observation as a percent of all. The total right. was only 35%, 35.2% of the total. Um, observation as percent of of the number of men is thirty seven percent of the men and thirty percent of women thirty point seven percent of women, but there was again a much smaller number of women than there were. Right, but, that's the other problem. It's not. Yeah, it's not com it controlled exactly. Yeah. Okay. They've got a large and, I, and also you got to do the analysis, but yeah, you got to put men in sandals and you got to put men in heels. I'm sorry, that is the only way you can actually. <sighs> identify any of these things as real variables as a real risk is it, is yeah. it, is it i mean just walking in heels i don't know yeah hmm yes i want to see how they got these p-values i'm very i'm very skeptical of these p-values <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't like it. I don't. Yeah, I I I brought it because I thought it was ridiculous. And yeah. <laughs> like okay, sure. <sighs> any any anybody anybody. If you want to be safe on stairs, please use a handrail. Yeah. Don't look at your phone. Don't, don't look at your phone. Make attention, uh, pay attention to where the stairs are when you're yeah. starting down the steps so that you have a good sense. Make sure that the stairs, these are campus stairs, so they're going to be regular. Sometimes in old houses, stairs are weird, so you don't know what's going to be happening there. And if they're slippery, you don't know. So pay attention. Stairs yeah. are stairs. Don't I, be like I think a young also, person like me and just go head first down the stairs. Wee! Scary I, mommy I think, to death. I think the that. thing that's like more likely to identify if you're going to be careful on stairs or not is if you uh, had a lot of accidents before. That's, I'm, I'm very careful on stairs. I'm very careful on inclines. I'm very careful in a lot of situations because I went through a very clumsy period. <laughs> And I fell down a lot. <laughs> it was, I think it was when I grew about a foot and a half in less than a year. Um, I, I it took a while for me to figure to get my body out. used to yeah. how it all moves, right? Yeah. Your body's figuring and, it out. Yeah. And so I, I am very careful now in all those areas. And I cannot think of the last time I actually fell downstairs or, or fell down going upstairs. And it's because I, I'm always holding the handrail and I am paying attention. I'm looking at my feet. <laughs> Pay attention, everybody. This is, I mean, honestly, this is the thing. Pay attention, everybody. Be careful on stairs. Stairs are dangerous. I guess it's when you're younger, you're more free and, I don't know, not paying as much mm -hmm. attention. And maybe it's lack of experience. Maybe it's an undeveloped prefrontal cortex. I don't know. But just be careful on stairs, all right? Please? Yeah. Especially if you're wearing sandals or high heels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um oh this is my other this is my other fun one that I love. Um so uh, if you were to go to a sermon, a religious sermon. Shaky um, premise, but continue. <laughs> yes, for whomever is out there. Um and your preacher, we're not a human, but we're a robot. How ah. would you feel? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I have trouble answering that question because of the premise itself, but I think, um, wow, that's really interesting. I need to know about that robot. <laughs> Who is this robot? Why is this robot preaching? What's he me? programmed with? Great. Why does this robot think that it has the information that I need to live my life better and according to whichever religion this is? Uh, so, these researchers publishing in the Journal of Experimental Psychology have uh, they put forward an experiment in an automated Buddhist temple. So, right, preacher, Buddhist temple. I've, this is also right. something Those interesting. Those words are not quite right, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, and so that was a recently automated Buddhist temple. And then they did a second study in a... Uh, a Taoist temple, and they found that people perceive robot preachers preachers to be less credible than humans. Uh huh. Again, your point being, how are they programmed? What is yeah. going on here? Why? Is, um, the researchers say this lack of credibility explains reductions in re religious commitment after people listen to robot versus human preachers deliver sermons. They did a third study um, that, again, replicated the findings in an online experiment and uh, suggests that religious elites require a, a mind. People need to perceive that that spiritual leader, religious leader, the elite who is preaching has a mind <laughs> that is experienced, okay. that is knowledgeable, sure. that there is agency, that that brings the credibility. And right. this is partly why robot preachers are less inspirational to humans than humans. Why do we, why do we, why, why robot preachers? 
because be, because <laughs> robots are everywhere and they're infiltrating everything everywhere. So right. why not robot preachers? Um, okay. They're just I guess... they're checking it out, right? Where would preach? Where would robots work? Could robots work in a mm. church? Could they not work in a church? But, uh, okay. All right. Um, but what I what I would also be interested to see is if you gave somebody like a passage, like a sermon, let's say, mm -hmm. written down on a piece of paper. And you said this was written by a preacher and you said this was written by AI or whatever. And or you didn't label it either way. Mm -hmm. Would people be able to tell? Probably not. Right. That's a that's a that's a very important question. Right. Does but would they care? Yes. Yes. Because that's what religion's for. It's squishy. It's squishy, but there's also dogma. So, right. um, yeah. So but the, the it's, it's person based, though, is the idea, right? Like it's yeah, it's you're putting you're it, putting faith in, in. It's person in based, yeah. right? But then those people are supposedly tapped into something right. that is higher than right. ourselves, right? That there is a connection that they are you know, helping you, guiding you, but, uh, yeah, AI guiding you, um, a robot that has been programmed is using AI to do the sermon. Um, yeah. What if, what if though, it is, what if, what if it, it's bringing all of the, all of the data, the information from the religious texts, from centuries of religious learning and scholarship and bringing it to you in those sermons, right. you know? Yeah. It could be better than a human. And that's what I was thinking was wondering is if you told somebody this robot is basically an audiobook of your favorite <laughs> preacher that no longer that is no longer with us, who has passed on. And he's going to read you so and so's sermon from 1972 or whatever, right? Would people like that? Whether that's true or not. Right. Because then you're you're giving the credibility of this is actually this other person's words. You're just hearing it from a robot right now. Right. You're getting to hear it kind of like it's live right yeah. now with this robot. It could be like robot Disneyland. Or yes. Like, yeah. Like great moments with Mr. Lincoln. Yes. Yeah. It would be like religion land. Right. Like, <laughs> that exists. Know. Right. I'm pretty sure that exists. Probably. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think it does. Um. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah i this this is a study i don't know if we need it i think we do this right <laughs> and that yeah i again this is kind of this is a okay someone did a study and they published it and people aren't into robots as preachers yet and this was kind See, what of what would be interesting though we're not there yet would do you would you believe in a robot doctor that would be interesting because yeah do you need doing the that. person do you need the human to feel like you're getting the uh, the back and forth and the subjective response and all these sorts of things? Or like, because religion in and of itself is, as you said, you're, you're, you're supposing a connection to a higher power, which a mm -hmm. robot cannot have. Mm -mm. But Should with, the, according with like to a doctor. The way we view AI as of now, no, maybe sometime right. in the future. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, I'd, I'd have to believe in a higher power to understand how any of that works. But anyway, yeah. um, the doctor is supposed to be your best access to all medical knowledge. And if you had a robot doctor, they potentially have much more in their brain than a human does. Would you believe the robot doctor or would you want to have a human doctor? That's the kind of thing that I think actually would be really interesting to see because even I myself don't know how I would feel about it in the moment. Uh, there's part of me that says I want the person. But then yeah. when it comes to something like surgery, maybe a robot surgeon would be better. Or, you know, right. I, yeah. it's a Or very... you're suggesting this medication. What's the statistics on the side effects and yeah. the benefits and all this kind of like yeah. a human can't give me that. <laughs> So something also interesting on the doctor front, there was a, uh, a study came out this last week in which they were trying to figure out how networks of doctors can help each other. And there's the concept of like the regression toward the mean, where you would think that if you have really good doctors and really bad doctors, that eventually all the doc doctors putting their input in, the 
good doctors will become a little bit less good and the bad doctors will become a little bit better, but they all regress to the mean. But they discovered that that's not true. That what happens is that the best doctors stay the best doctors mm. and the, the worst doctors get better. So that Whoa. actually information sharing and the networking of doctors is better for everyone on a whole as to as opposed Whoa. to doctors working independently. Which that is, is very cool. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was really, I was like, oh, interesting. I hope my doctors are talking to other doctors. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Robot mm -hmm. preacher, no thanks. Robot doctor, maybe. So we're thinking about robot preachers, robot doctors, but have you ever thought about robbing an art museum? No. <laughs> <laughs> You've never... Have you? <laughs> I don't know. I've watched those... Yeah. movies and tv like, shows national or, treasures or, yeah, i, I guess i've thought about it something and i guess i've kind of thought about it when it comes to the british museum because everything in there is stolen anyway <laughs> <laughs> like, wouldn't it be cool to actually take this? some stuff out of there yeah and repatriate it that would be excellent but no i've never really thought about it i guess <laughs> <laughs> well some scientists at Duke University decided to think about it, and they had um, this paper they just published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that uh, explains their work in which they had two groups of people, and the particip participants were assigned randomly to one of two different backstories. And there was an urgent group so the urgent group was told, you're a master thief, you're doing the heist right now, steal as much as you can. And then they were put into a video game, which was kind of like a walkthrough of an art museum, and they had to go through and try out and steal as much art from this virtual art museum as possible. For the other group, they called the curious group, they told them, you're a thief, and you're scouting the museum to plan for a future heist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now you have two groups of people going through the same game, but with very different goals yes. and yeah. different ways of experiencing it. The next day, they had people come back and they gave them a pop quiz about the art and the prices of the art and details about the art that they had seen in the museum. The uh, participants had to flag the paintings as familiar or and how much they cost and everything. The curious participants recognized more paintings and remembered how much each painting was worth. So being curious boosted the memory for more information overall. Okay. The urgent group did not have that. They didn't see that kind of increased memory. But the urgent group did have an advantage. They were better at figuring out where in the museum were the more expensive paintings. So <laughs> they, they had figured out how to get more value out of the museum than the curious. Interesting. Group, yeah. And so the researchers are looking at this now in terms of like these different strategies and how they are adaptive and potentially used in different situations. And so like the researcher says in this press release from Duke University, if you're on a hike and there's a bear, you don't want to be thinking about long-term planning. You're going to focus on getting out of there right now. Um, other things that require really short-term focus might and be involved in like uh, messaging for public health issues, like trying to figure out how to prompt people to go get a COVID vaccine. How do you take advantage of urgency as opposed to curiosity? Or if you want it to be a more long-term activation, how do you not get them stressed out? How do you make them feel calm and, you know, be able to actually pay attention to more details? So you want to have people seek information, remember it for the future and pay more attention for things that maybe are like a bigger lifestyle change with larger consequences. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So now, yeah. So they think, you know, urgency is more involved 
with the amygdala being activated, fear and anxiety and emotion. Um, and that has definitely impact on certain memories for like urgent mode stuff, like you have more focused, efficient memories. But mm -hmm. the curious exploration might uh, might stimulate more dopamine release and a different regions of the brain, like the hippocampus for memory storage. Yeah. So, I mean, you asked me if I've ever thought about robbing an art museum, and I haven't. Oh, now However, you're thinking about it again. <laughs> no, this is, it's funny that I, that what actually completely slipped my mind is that I'm currently in a Dungeons and Dragons campaign that is all heist-based. <laughs> and so, uh, it was supposed to be, That's I think awesome. it, was, it was supposed to be a one-shot. It was supposed to be like a four-hour thing, right? Um, we've now met three times. Um, for multiple hours each time and we have we just finished the um the initial planning stage the actual like recon mission and uh -huh. and so how many I, details I thinking, do you yes, remember exactly. related you, to the heist every room talked to every person figured yeah. out what was going on in every part of this area and so now we're going to go back and the actual heist itself is probably only going to take one session but um it's i think you're so right about how you know when you when you're in that curious stage there's so much more room to to gather information and you're kind of assembling kind of thought processes. There were a couple moments where we thought maybe we were in trouble and we were going to have to <laughs> smash and grab and go. And suddenly it's all about where are my exits? Uh, what are the risks? How can I yep. get out of here as fast as possible? I don't care about that hallway. I haven't looked down. Who cares what's down there? Who so cares? Where, definitely... What are the things I do know? How yes. much, what is the most I can get out of here with safely? Yeah, yes. absolutely. It's, it's I think so that, funny. I think that's hilarious. But I, yeah, I think the other thing is that, you know, this is kind of like a memory castle kind of thing. So if you do want mm -hmm. to use this kind of strategy for your own memory techniques and remembering things in the future, like give yourself that kind of maybe heist kind of strategy and, mm -hmm. you know, think about it from that perspective. Like, what do you want to know and what do you need to remember if you're going to be successful on, you know, that test later on at the end of the week, you know, what are, yes. you know, how can you wander through a historical situation to remember that all these details, or how can you wander through an art museum or a science museum or whatever to get as much and retain as much information as possible? Yeah, that's so fun. I love that. But it does kind of speak to this other piece about the, um, kind of just how your brain works in moments of of planning and when you know you're not in trouble and no alarms yeah. are going off and versus fight or flight time Gotta go. <laughs> what is essential yeah. Yeah. yeah so that that's a that's a good reminder too where if you're having trouble learning something or remembering something or being engaged in something do you have any alarms going off in your brain do you have some fight or flight that's kind of cueing you in to prevent you from having those curious moments? Yes. Do you need to take care of any Ma of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Do you yes. need to use the restroom? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you threatened? Like, is there something else going on that could be preventing you from learning in that moment? And that is the take home message at the end of this week in science this week. <laughs> Take care of your basic needs so that you can learn. So you can be curious because, yes. yeah, yeah. You don't need to be curious. You want to be curious. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think you need to be curious, but I mean, come on. We're going to talk about it. We've come to the end. Yes. Yes. We did We've it. Done We've it. made it. We've made it all the way through another episode of This Week in Science with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to everyone in the chat room. I did see you talking about soccer in there. Let's go Portland Timbers. That's great. But come on, it's science. You did make it. You did make it through the show and chat about science with us. And I appreciate that for all our chat rooms. Not Facebook tonight, unfortunately, but Twitch and YouTube. Thanks for being there. 
Thank you so much, Fada. Thank you for your help with show notes and social media. Thank you to Identity4 for recording the show. Thank you to Gord, Aaron Lore, others who help keep the chat rooms nice places to hang out. And Rachel, thank you so much for editing the show. And of course, as always, thank you to all of our Patreon sponsors who without whom without whom we would not be able to do the show. Thank you to Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, George Chorus, Fiel Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak, Vigard Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Don Mundus, P.I.G., Stephen Alboran, Dale Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E., Youngblood, Sean Clarence, Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, G. Burton Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RTM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric, Nap EO, Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luth, and Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tommy Steele. Thank you all for all of your support on Patreon. If any of you out there would like to support us on Patreon, please head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from YouTube and hopefully Facebook and from twist.org slash live. Oh, and Justin will be back next week also. We hope. Fingers crossed. Haven't heard from him in three weeks, so have actually no clue whatsoever. You're right. I'm guessing (laughs) based on month-old information that he will be back. (laughs) Exactly. Want to listen to us as a podcast? Well, just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. And if you enjoy the show, please get your friends to listen too. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to the stories that we discussed will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for a newsletter that may come to your inbox someday. Someday. Yes. Um, you can contact us directly. Email me, Kirsten, at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Put twists in the subject line so your email doesn't get spam filtered into a robot preacher in a church that no one's going to anymore because who wants to go listen to a robot preacher anyway? Speaking of robot (laughs) preachers, you can also try to hit us up on what used to be called Twitter. (laughs) I don't know. Um, You can try. In um, at Twist day. Science, at Dr. More. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, at Blair's Menagerie. I haven't even opened that app in several weeks, but you know, you can get, you can give it a go. Um, Find us. We do love your feedback, though. So uh, for email, <laughs> at least, we love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like to cover, or address, or suggestion for an interview, please let us know. And we will be back here again next week, and we hope that you will join us again for more great science news and if you've learned anything at all from the show today remember it's all in your head (laughs) this week in science this week in science this week in science This week in science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week's science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science This week in science This week in science 
This week in science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand that we're not. not threatening anybody i really hope not i like you all i don't want to threaten anybody especially not in the after show which is where we are now <sighs> that was fun yeah weren't there some ridiculous stories this week i had to talk yeah, about i was them. so bummed i was so happy about all my stories and then i was kind of doing my second pass on them and going what <laughs> But, but I think that's one of the fun parts of it, though, is not just yeah. going, hey, it's just this cool thing. It's also digging in and going, hey, but uh, now this is how I'm critical of what they've done. And that's, you know, I think that's important. That is part of the science conversation. that needs Yeah, to happen, no, absolutely. Right? For sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe <sighs> if they had published on a preprint journal you could have commented earlier and <laughs> yeah why didn't they ask me is why my whole they, thing why didn't they go to your first player come on i don't know i don't get it <laughs> what the heck what the heck what the heck oh identity four has grabbed a an image that i love let me see if i'll share it looks like something from Futurama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> certainly. It certainly does. Hmm. About preacher. I don't know. That whole thing seems very strange that they went straight to preacher. <laughs> and also right. Buddhism and Taoism. Like I mean, part of okay. it I think was because I mean, they, I think they were Japanese researchers, and so they're uh, that's more in their. Actually, I think that's a great question. Let me go. Let me go back and see what I can find because that is interesting. Because it's like of all of them, I mean, were they thinking well, that of all of them that those would be more accepting or maybe most? Maybe accepting? that that's what I was wondering because it's a lot more yeah. of just like here's here's the structure but it's it, i think there's also generally less like evangelism happening yeah. in taoism and buddhism so it's Ex i don't know exactly if that's, it might be more acceptable it's i don't know mm, very interesting man i want the advanced online Thingy, don't make me have to get access, people. <sighs> anyway, it's, robot it's, preachers, yeah. bad for religious commitment. <laughs> Man. Where else? Will, where else? I mean, does this mean, like, what about robot politicians? Or, like... Well, you can't pay off a robot, so... <laughs> might be better <laughs> that of all things could even yeah. be the you can't solution. shame a robot but also it seems like you can't shame a lot of politicians these days either so mm -hmm. nothing lost there oh here's a they also get uh robot preachers get fewer donations <laughs> Not just undermining credibility. They also reduce donations for religious. My groups. question is, what if you like blinded it? What if they can't tell? Uh, yeah. What if you made it so they yeah. couldn't tell if it was a robot or a real preacher? Then would it matter? I bet it wouldn't. So there's in Portland, and I, I know in like nickel arcades and other places, and I there are the um the the future telling kind of head talking about Zoltar? <laughs> Zoltar yes <laughs> you know you put in your money and then Zoltar is like ar, 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 ar. I'm gonna make you it. big <laughs> <laughs> and the lights flash and you're like oh you 
you know, and is this just a different level of that where maybe it's less credible, but more of a, I don't know, people pay for it because it's like a, it's just like a, a, yeah. a gimmick or something like, oh, I'm going to go see the Buddhist sermon preacher or He's I'll a get a heart. I'll get a heart sutra for, you know, a dollar. I don't know. I don't know. That's jumping straight to preacher seems very wild to me. Uh -huh. Cause it is, I mean, the whole thing is subjective. So if you, if you take out subjectivity and you put yeah. something that's supposed to be objective, then you're changing the nature of, of the whole deal. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know. Seems strange. Yeah. It's the if the whole point is a higher power, then how does a robot how does that make any sense? It doesn't. Uh, I'm looking at more information on this study now and it's very in so uh the second study in the Taoist temple in Singapore they heard a sermon by a human priest and the other half heard the same sermon from a humanoid robot called Pepper okay. yeah um and then they uh th the researchers asked the participants on a scale from 1 to 5 to rate the credibility of each and so this is the interesting number Robot preacher on average received a credibility rating of 3.12 compared with 3.51 for the human. So the human was more credible, but not by much. <laughs> what? <laughs> that doesn't sound good at all. <sighs> okay. Ooh. Hmm. Yeah, but still, it, uh, you know, the third experiment did kind of similar to your question of is it, you know, AI written, you know, or hu or human sermon, and because the AI can't think or feel like a human, they didn't like the AI as much. So there's, you know, there's a lot of things they're looking into here, but huh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, more maybe. sure. Who out there thinks that? Are, I mean, there are out of five. No, I'm saying out of not out of ten. Out of one to five. Yeah, say. three out of ten would be pretty sad. <laughs> it would be even for both of them. It would be really bad. yeah, fascinating. Mm. Fascinated by. I just it. I is there going to be like the? I'm going to the to the church and the my communion or to my um my confession booth but it's you know you put in twenty dollars you go into a booth and zoltar's in there and you tell them your sins and then it's fine go ahead i mean is it going to turn into that eventually is this what are well we you'd have at? to are believe we... the robot has a direct line to god yeah which I think is going to be a hard sell. <laughs> Cause that's the point, yeah. right? That's the point of the confessional is that they're, you're talking to somebody who's really keyed in and they're saying, I, I have word with the man upstairs. I'm going to absolve you. I'm going to put in a good word for you, bud. Just go do your rosaries or whatever they are. Right. Your hail Marys. Uh -huh. And you'll, and I'll, I'll tell him, I'll tell him you're all good now. So, if a robot doesn't have the ability to tell new but if a human no. doesn't but in the future if a human doesn't have the ability to tell the difference between an AI and a human say it's a text chat or say it is a right. deep fake kind of situation mm -hmm. generative AI producing a preacher a priest a right. you know insert official figure here does it then matter right you know that's a, it's yeah i'm not the person to ask 
I'm not either, but I just, I find it absolutely <laughs> fascinating. You know, where yeah. is the, how far does it go? How, when, right. you know, at some point there, maybe there will be people in space. Maybe it will be like the expanse where we've got, you know, outposts and people all over the place, but you don't necessarily have that person. So maybe you're doing right. like AI generated stuff so that you can maintain whatever mm -hmm. faith it is or whatever develops right. as faith out in space with you know with the future and there's so many possibilities and maybe there is a time to come where it all is ai as god or yeah all knowing I can, higher power i could see you having like an ai hologram that reads scripture or like farm scripture to give advice based on very specific queries or all these sorts of things, v things very close to the sermon that the study was about. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think it's like, it's the interactive, it's the confessional, it's the like uh, blessings. It's the stuff that's supposed to be very interactive that I, it's hard for me to see a point at which someone could maintain their faith and go, but this robot is fine. <laughs> This robot's fine. We're, yeah, this this yeah. will do in a pinch. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I Eric, don't know. Now I'm going to have to go look up the pray, that pray home companion bit. Eric Knapp is bringing up 20 years so ago. Pray home companion had a bit called LOL Lutherans online. So I'm going to have to find that. That'll be interesting. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, no, I'm saying I would be very happy confessing to Falcor. Like Falcor and the never ending oh, story. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Falcor, I'll cry on you and you give me a big a Falcor smile hug and and then I'm ha I'm happy. Falcor is that's my kind of animatronic robot. I'm a huge go. fan. <laughs> he was so cute and cuddly looking. Oh my god. And also wise. And also wise. <laughs> Caring. Oh, yes. Yeah. Maybe the robot has Google Fiber up into heaven. Starlink. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Uh -huh. <laughs> Maybe it does. Yep. Hmm. Mm. <sighs> oh, my gosh. Eric, you've got the best little tidbits tonight. There was once a very old joke about using politicians in lab studies because the animal rights people wouldn't object. ba da bump da 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 all right well i hope the Port portland timbers won tonight that would be fantastic yeah there are sports happening apparently there's sports happening it's and it's summer and so i hope people are enjoying their time and well i mean it's not summer everywhere i am very hemisphere centric and i apologize yes. for that. <laughs> I do try, although I do know that we have our wonderful listeners down in Australia, New Zealand. Africa, oh, yeah, and Pamela told places. us last week, even though it's winter there, it was hot. hot. So it's basically summer there anyway. Always. Yeah. Man. <sighs> well, everybody, I think we've done it. Have we done it, Blair? Yeah. Say goodnight, Kiki. Good night, Kiki. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. <laughs> good night, <laughs> listeners. Good night, everyone. We will be back in another week. And I do hope in the meantime, you stay thoughtful, you stay safe, you stay healthy, you stay curious, and Justin's favorite, stay lucky. We'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs>